Good morning, everyone. So good to see you this morning on this first day of 2023. The Lord is good. The Lord is great. The Lord is grateful, is faithful, and we are thankful and grateful for his many blessings. The church today looks good. Uh, I trust you've had a, a wonderful time with your family and friends, holiday season, and we're ready to, uh, to have a great year here at Park Place. The Lord has many plans for your life. He has many plans for this church. And uh, we had a very good discussion in our class this morning about Park Place and its future. Um, if we will listen, if we will obey, God will do the rest. He has every ability to meet every need in our lives. He has every ability to do the things that we see as hard or difficult or even impossible if we only believe and obey. So let's plan to take that theme into the new year. Uh, let's challenge ourselves, and I want to say a little bit more about this in a, in a few minutes, but let's challenge ourselves in this new year to listen, not just to hear, but to listen and then to obey. And I guarantee you, that's from my, uh, from my, uh, well, never mind. Louisiana brogue is guarantee you. So I guarantee you that God will do his part if we will do ours. The Lord is good. At this time, we're going to call uh, Don forward to lead us in a congregational. You stand. Sing victory in Jesus.
try to get through this. I've got uh, something going on in my head that's not normally there. God, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to my Savior lives because He lives I can face tomorrow because He lives all fear is gone because I know Uncertain days because he lives. And then one day. just wanted to uh, make a few comments and then pray before our pastor comes to uh, give us our New Year's message. I don't know if it's a New Year's message or just a regular message. Okay, praise the Lord. <laughs> then I don't have to say a whole lot about it then. But I do want to challenge this church to have faith in God. In fact, I was going to sing a song, and you stole my uh, my thunder there. So I'm just going to pass on that. I haven't sang in church in a, as as a solo in over 20 years, so it's probably a good thing that I uh, not do that today. Um, but God is faithful, 
and he has been so faithful in my life. Uh, I haven't told my story to too many people uh, at Green Street or here at Park Place. I did share uh, some of it with uh, my class on a day when it was a very low attendance day, Jerry. Uh, but God is incredibly faithful if we will uh, seek him with all of our hearts, place ourselves at his feet, listen carefully to his call and obey. And I want to challenge this church in 2023 to do just that. And we will all be amazed at what God does here at Park Place. So let's give him our heart, give him our whole heart and our whole uh, mind and serve him with great strength this year. And let's see what God does. Let me pray and then pastor come and preach. Father, thank you for this time. For us to um, look back at 2022, see the things that we accomplished, see the failures that we had, place them all at your feet and determine in 2023 to listen and obey and to see what you can do with our lives. We pray for those who are sick among us who need a touch from God for their bodies for healing. I pray that you would touch each one with a special touch of healing. Lord, touch those who are uh, in need of an uplift of spirit. Help them to know that you are able to meet all their needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for this church and for what you're going to do for us as we seek and obey as we see the new year come our way. And we pray right now that you would bless our pastor as he brings the message. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. It's so good to see you all this morning and happy new year. And uh, Brother Don, I want to tell you... Uh, Chris would be proud this morning, brother. You leading us in worship. Didn't Don do just a fine job? I love, I love that song, Because He Lives. I sure do. And, um, you know, I thought about that line uh, in that one verse that we sang, something to the effect, this child can face uncertain days because he lives. You know, we're starting out a brand new year. I can't think of a better way to begin a brand new year than being with God's people in church on the very first day of a brand new year. But we don't know what this year will hold for us, do we? But we know who's in charge. And our lives are in the hands of God. And because we serve a risen Savior, we can face the uncertainty of what may come our way. What's uncertain with us is always certain and sure with Almighty God. And so I'm so thankful. And I'm grateful that you were able to come last week, and uh, what a great number of you folks came to worship with us on Christmas Day over at, uh, I'm going to start calling it the main campus, I guess, I don't know what I'll call it, but because you're just part of us, and I'm just so thankful you, you were able to be there, and I uh, hope and pray you have had a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year, and uh, I'll be honest, I for one am ready to begin the new year with a sense of challenge, and uh, a lot of people come to the new year, they make resolutions, and they think, okay, well, now is the time to start some things that I've been putting off and procrastinating. And there's a lot of people who approach the new year with a, a new, renewed sense of hope. And that's all well and good till about January 4th, you know, when the reality sets in. <laughs> but as the people of God, our, our faith is not in a calendar date because January 1 is no different than December 31 for that matter. But I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said that for the Christian, the Christian life is a series of new beginnings. That, that we have new opportunity in a new day and every day ought to present itself with just a brand new opportunity to be in Christ. All things have become new. The old has passed away and the new has come. And so I'm so thankful for that. You know, the fact of the matter is, I couldn't help but think last night, I went to bed early last night, I didn't stay up and watch the, I should have, because 
the guns blaring, the bombs going off. You know, it sounded like the 4th of July in our neighborhood last night, about from 12 o'clock to about 2 o'clock. And, uh, but I was just thinking through all of the celebration at Times Square, all of the capital cities of the world, people ringing in the new year, and what a sense of empty celebration there was among so many people who are putting their hopes in perhaps a calendar date only to realize that a date on the calendar has no power to change their life or really give them a brand new beginning because that's something that only Jesus Christ can do. But a lot of people are, are profoundly bored in life. There's a sense of boredom that they find themselves plagued by in life and they sense, well, there's got to be some type of meaningful purpose that I'm supposed to be a part of. And yet people can't quite wrap their mind around what that purpose may be. And even within the church, I, I sense a profound sense of boredom. Uh, if God saved us for nothing more than church services, then folks, we've completely missed it. But all of this is simply a means to an end. Preaching is a means to an end. Gathering together with the people of God is a means to an end. And there's a mission that God has given us as his people. In fact, I've heard it said this way. God has a church for his mission, not a mission for his church. When you think about it, the church exists for the sole benefit. It's the only organization in the world that exists for the sole benefit of people who are not a part of it. <laughs> and you think about the world around us and people who are bored with life, who think that the things of life can satisfy. And people are just, they do crazy things out of a sense of boredom. Kind of reminds me of a story I read about a guy named Larry Walters. He was a California man who years ago made headlines for doing something crazy. Uh, Larry went to his local Army-Navy surplus store. He bought 75 used weather balloons. He inflated them with helium, attached them to a lawn chair that he had secured to the back of his pickup truck. And with several of his buddies watching, Larry climbed in the lawn chair, he settled in, and he had a friend cut the rope. <laughs> now, he was hoping to just observe his neighborhood from just a slightly different angle and maybe gain a new perspective on life, and he took nothing with him but a peanut butter sandwich and a BB gun. <laughs> Two and a half hours later, the Los Angeles International Airport reported an unidentified flying object in the skies above LAX at nearly 16,000 feet. Lawn Chair Larry, as he's now remembered and infamously remembered as, he was nearly three miles in the sky and 100 miles away from his original launch site. Now you can look this up, but the pilot of the 737 who first spotted Larry said this to, I guess, air traffic control. Uh, well, uh, I see what looks like a perfectly still man sitting in a, is it a lawn chair? And I think he's holding a rifle. In a remarkable rescue stunt, SWAT teams lassoed Larry, who had passed out in the chair, and they ferried him safely to the ground. Now, here's what his intentions were. He intended to slowly float up to the right altitude, use his BB gun to pop the balloons one by one to try to bring himself down. However, whenever he was cut loose from the pickup truck, Eyewitnesses said that he shot up into the air as if he had been fired from a cannon. And so Larry panicked. He passed out. Back on the ground, after being revived to consciousness, he was promptly issued a fine for obstruction of airport traffic. And a local journalist asked him a series of questions, three questions. Uh, Larry, were you scared? His answer, yep. <laughs> uh, Larry, would you do it again? His answer, nope. Larry, why did you do it to begin with? To which he said, I guess I just got tired of sitting around. <laughs> now folks, listen, people who get bored in life and distracted in life, they, they end up doing crazy things. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go into a new year with a sense of complacency where I'm looking for something to try to satisfy some type of longing within my heart that only Christ and being obedient to the mission of God in the world can fulfill. 
I don't want to be complacent, not when there's a world around me that's lost and desperately in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 3 for just a few minutes this morning, where I want to return to a passage of Scripture that we really began looking at a couple of weeks ago, uh, the commission of Moses, the call of Moses at the burning bush. And really this is a reminder that every believer has a job to do. Every believer has a calling to fulfill and a responsibility to embrace. And yet one thing you'll notice from the experience of Moses is that before he's sent out by God uh, with a mission from God, Moses is first drawn close to God, where God reveals himself to Moses in a powerful way. And we learn from Moses' example that all true service, first of all, it's got to begin in the presence of God. It's not that we just rush out into a world in need and do what we want to or we try to save the world in our own efforts or our own strength. But folks, as we really get alone with God, as we as the people of God get close to God and experience the power of God through personal worship, and we get a vision of who God is, you can't help but be sent out in the world around you with a sense of mission and purpose. And that's something that we see illustrated in Moses' life, but it's really true of every person that God calls all throughout the pages of Scripture. So Moses is going to be a worshiper before he's a worker. And his work is only going to be energized by his worship. So Exodus 3, verse 1, the Bible says Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off of your feet, for the place on which you were standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Those were the peoples that were living in the promised land at the time. And so God goes on and says, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So, so notice what's happening here. Moses is having an encounter at the burning bush with the manifest presence of God. God reveals himself to Moses. And God is commissioning Moses. From this experience, Moses is going to be sent out on mission for God. Notice how he responds in verse 11. But Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that I've sent you when you've brought the people out of Egypt you shall serve God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am, or I am that I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also says to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. And we'll stop reading there. I want to speak for just a few moments this morning from this subject, responding to the call of God. Because essentially that's what we find in these verses. God is calling Moses, and Moses responds to the call of God. Now, you'll notice that this dialogue between Moses and God will uh, pretty much be the content of chapter 3 as well as chapter 4. And, and God is revealing himself to Moses in a dynamic, powerful way. He reveals his covenant name by which he's known and made himself known to Moses. I am. Uh, in Hebrew, it's simply four consonants uh, from which we get the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Uh, so God is revealing his name, his covenant name to Moses. And notice Moses really asks two questions in this passage. The first question is, who am I? And then he asks the question to God, who are you? And by the way, those are two fundamental questions that every person needs answered in their life. And you really won't have the answer to the first question until you understand the answer to the second. It's only as we come to know who God is that we truly are able to understand who we are. And the world is full of people who are trying to discover themselves and they're trying to find out the meaning of life and the purpose of life and what's my life ultimately all about. And they're asking the question, who am I? When in reality, that question can only be answered when you know who God is. When you meet the I am in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So pay close attention to the fact that Moses is being called here. The call of Moses, I think that word call is one of the most simple words in the English language that we use on a regular basis. We call someone up on the telephone. Uh, You know, when you were a a kid, you got called to the dinner table, the supper table. We call our kids to supper. Uh, It was a terror in our life when we were in school to be called to the principal's office. Uh, Or you were called by your employer. And it's a compelling summons. And that's what a call really is. There are all kinds of calls. Most important is a divine sense of call. And that's what we're discovering here in this passage of Scripture. It's God who's taking the initiative to call out to Moses. And so this brings up the very important issue of calling. What does it mean to have the call of God upon your life? God called Moses... But does that mean that God doesn't call other people? Does he call other people to still serve him in some capacity today? And if God still does call people, how does he go about doing it? And if he is calling me, how do I know that he's calling me? All of these are questions that relate to this issue of calling. Now, obviously, God's call of Moses at the burning bush, this was unique in redemptive history, and this is not normal experience. And there is a sense in which every Christian has a calling upon his or her life. Now, I think this is important, and I don't think that we talk about this in the church anywhere near enough. A lot of times when we refer to calling, we only refer to it in the sense of calling to full-time vocational ministry. And we tend to think, well, the only people who are really called by God, well, my pastor is called by God. Evangelists are called by God. Uh, missionaries are called by God, but, but pastor, I'm just a regular Christian. I don't, I don't know that I have the sense of God's call upon my life, to which I would say, whether you realize it or not, to be a Christian is to have a calling upon your life. Every believer has the call of God upon his or her life in some capacity. Now, it may not be a call to full-time vocational Christian service, but it is a calling nonetheless you study your Bible, you'll discover that there are at least three general callings that all of us have as believers. Uh, There's first of all the call to salvation. Um, In the Bible, that word call, in the New Testament, there's a Greek word kaleo. This word call in English comes from that word, but that's a word that's most often used to refer to God's initiative to bring people to Christ who participate in his redemptive work in the world. 
The Apostle Paul uses this word in Romans chapter 8 when he describes those who are the called according to God's own purpose. Who is that? Well, that's me, that's you, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. At some point in your life, if you are a believer in Christ, whether you were a child, whether you came to faith as an adult, you responded to a call from the Spirit of God. You came to faith in Jesus Christ. And so there's the call to salvation. A second general calling that we all share as believers is the call to sanctification. That is, it's the will of God for your life to be conformed to the image of God's own Son. I think sometimes we try to make the will of God far too mysterious and mystical than it should be. Someone says, well, I'm just trying to figure out the will of God for my life. And and they're waiting for a voice when God's already given them a verse. And and here's the verse. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children, don't be conformed to the passion of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, so you also be holy in all of your conduct. So the idea is there's this call to salvation, there's this call to sanctification, and then a third general calling that we all have upon our lives is the call to service. Salvation, sanctification, and service. And that simply means that all of us have been called to serve God with our lives in some capacity that is in accordance with our gifting. It's not that some are called to Christ and then they go on to service. No, to be called by Christ is to be called to service. God doesn't invite some in the church to be the servants and others to be the served. All of us are called to be the servants. All of us are called to advance the mission of God in the world. All of us have the calling of God upon our lives to make disciples. And so if you're a Christian and you know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way, that means you've received the divine call upon your life to make him known to a world that is in the dark. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So right there, Peter says that if you are a Christian, you have the call of God upon your life. And here's what that calling involves. Make Jesus Christ known to a world that doesn't know him. Point people to the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. And so we've got to get away from this idea that only a few people are called to ministry. No, all of us are called to ministry. Now, there's some who are called to vocational Christian service. Paul deals with this in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that some are pastors and evangelists and teachers, but they've been given not to do the work of ministry, but to equip the church, to equip the saints to do the work of ministry because we all have the calling of God upon our life to take the gospel to the nations. And folks, that's something that we really see illustrated here in this passage in Exodus chapter 3. Moses has the call of God upon his life. Now, it's a unique calling in Moses' case. There's nobody else who's been called to be the lawgiver. I mean, this is God's calling upon Moses. It's unique in redemptive history, but there are some profound lessons, I think, that it teaches us as far as calling is concerned. And so what are those lessons? Well, lesson number one, you can write this down. It's a lesson in availability. Availability. Now, I want to ask you this question, sort of phrase this point in the form of a question. With availability, am I in a place where I can clearly discern the will of God? Because notice Moses here, the call of God comes, but Moses is available. And Moses makes himself available. At this point in his life, he's been in the wilderness of Midian for 40 years. He's a shepherd who's been tending the flocks of his father-in-law. He's in a place of obscurity. And all that he's experienced thus far in his life has been preparing him, carefully crafted by the hand of God, preparing him for this moment of encounter by which he's going to be called by God. 
You see the providence of God at work behind the scenes in his life, leading him to a very remote place, an out-of-the-way place in the backside of the wilderness at Horeb or Mount Sinai. And, and so he's, he's there, he's tending sheep, he's free from distraction, and he comes to meet God face to face. So he sees something that catches his attention, and he sees that it's a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And so what does Moses do? Well, he goes in for a closer look. You look at verse 2, uh, it says that the angel of the Lord appears to him in a flame of fire in the midst of this bush. It's not an ordinary flame, but this is the flame of God's manifest presence. Verse 3 says that Moses says, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to turn aside. I'm going to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Now, folks, what I want you to notice, though, pay close attention to verse 4, and especially the first phrase there in verse 4, because it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called. That is, when Moses stopped, Moses is in the position of availability, God calls out to him. And he calls him by name, Moses. Moses. And to which Moses responds by simply saying, here I am. In other words, he's placing himself at the disposal of the one who's calling out to him. And I find here a profound lesson of availability being illustrated. That's the right response to the call of God upon your life, isn't it? Lord, here I am. What is it that you would say? What is it that you would teach? What is it that you would have of my life? It's the same way that Samuel responds to the Lord. Whenever little Samuel, remember when God calls out to Samuel as a boy serving there in the tabernacle in Shiloh? By night, God calls out to Samuel four times. And the first three times... Samuel gets up in the night and he goes to the, the priest Eli and he says, you called? And Eli says, nah, I go back to bed, you know. You, you, you didn't hear me call you. Well, then Samuel, Eli finally realizes what's going on and says, here's what you need to say the next time that, that the Lord calls you. You need to respond by saying, here I am, Lord, your servant is listening. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And so Samuel is placing himself there in that position of availability. God speaks, and then God reveals his will uh, in Samuel's life. It's the same response that we see the prophet Isaiah has whenever he responds to the call of God. When God asks the question, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? You remember how Isaiah responds? He says, here I am, send me having gotten a vision of who God is and all of his glory and majesty and power, he's ready to go. He's made himself available. It's with these same words that Moses responds with availability to the call of God upon his life. Now, folks, listen. That's one of the marks of a faithful servant. No matter who you are, no matter where you are currently in life, one of the marks of a faithful servant is an attentive ear and an immediate response to the voice of God. Uh, it's the attitude of Peter and Andrew in Mark chapter 1 when Jesus comes along and Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You know what the Bible says they did? Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So availability then is me being willing to adjust my schedule. I'm willing to adjust my agenda. I'm willing to change whatever plans that I may have for my own life so as to fit the desires of the God who calls me and then those, the needs of those to whom God sends me. It's to make priority the mission of God. Now, someone says, okay, well, does that mean I just need to stop what I'm doing? You know, I, I, I work in a machine shop. I'm a machinist. What does it mean for me as a Christian machinist to respond to the call of God upon my life? Listen to me may mean that God wants you to be the absolute best machinist that you can be for the glory of God and realize that right there by your machine, day in and day out, God can use you as a missionary to those who work beside you. You're a Christian businessman, Christian businesswoman, and God's given you a platform. Or you're some 
artisan. God's given you some type of particular skill set. You think, well, what does it mean for me to live out the calling of God upon my life? It may just be that God uses you, whatever skills and talents and abilities that he's endowed you with, you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna operate under this divine sense of calling and I'm gonna give all that I have and all that I am to God and allow him to use me however he sees fit. Kind of like Tim, right? He didn't know that he was telling me by telling me this, you will, you're becoming a sermon illustration this morning, Tim. But y'all see this right here? You know Tim made this? The Ten Commandments crafted this, carved this, stained this, built this. Listen, I don't have that kind of talent or that kind of ability to work with my hands and do that. But this man does. And you know what I see right there? I see somebody who's being obedient to the call of God upon his life. To take whatever skill, whatever talent that God has blessed him with, and to be a blessing with it in Jesus' name. And the fact of the matter is, every single one of us can do that in some capacity. So here's the thing. You, you go into a new year. What if we all go into 2023 and say, okay, I'm going to go about life under a divine sense of calling. I'm going to make myself available to whatever it is that God has for me, whatever it is that God wants to do through me, I'm going to place myself at his feet and into his hands. I'm going to commit all that I have. And folks, you'll be absolutely amazed how God will use you and how God will use the ministry of this local church and what he will do. So availability, that's the first lesson that I see. Now, not only availability, but there's a second lesson, and it's the lesson of teachability. Teachability. And, and so here's the question then. Do I possess the humility required to determine the will of God? Having made myself available, Moses says, here I am. Now you're going to notice in, in chapters 3 and 4 that Moses also has an attitude of teachability. He's going to learn some things. God's going to reveal to Moses who he is, who God is, the name of God. And Moses is going to respond in faith to all of that. And so he's got a teachable spirit. He's marked by a characteristic humility that's going to be true of his life. In fact, the scripture will say later of Moses that he was so very meek. He's a man who had a teachable spirit. So God gives him the instructions, and the first thing God tells him to do is to take his shoes off. Don't come too close, Moses, but take your sandals off of your feet because the very place upon which you stand is holy ground. It wasn't the dirt that was holy. It was the God who was there that made it holy. And so Moses takes his sandals off of his feet and God begins to reveal himself to Moses. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses, in response to this, he hides his face and the Bible says he was afraid to look at God. And so what you find in his life here is the fear of reverential worship. It's the kind of fear that the writer of Proverbs says that is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One. This is insight. So Moses is getting barefoot in the presence of God. In ancient days, slaves went barefoot before their master. And so Moses is humbly obeying God. He's indicating his willingness to serve by taking off his shoes. He's adopting the posture of a servant in the presence of God. And by the way, this ought to be something that reminds you of, of a thing that the disciples witnessed many centuries later in the upper room in John chapter 13, where, where the master himself takes a basin of water, girds himself with a towel, and with their sandals removed, what does Jesus do? He washes their feet. It's the very principle that Jesus had taught them earlier. He says, you know those who are the lords of the Gentiles? They lord it over those that they, they have authority over? He said, that's not how it's to be among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Now listen to this. Jesus says, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So here you have Moses in that position of a servant, barefoot 
in the presence of God at the burning bush. He's listening for his next instructions. And folks, that's the kind of teachable spirit I want to have in 2023. Speak, O Lord, because your servant is listening. As I pour over the scriptures, as I consider my own calling, as I consider my own giftedness, as I consider my own location where God's placed me to serve, I want to have a teachable spirit and make myself available and live with a sense of divine calling upon my life. Now, Moses is going to learn that God is a deliverer, that God is aware of the needs of his people who were in bondage in Egypt. God knows what they've been going through, and now God is ready to act. And yet, God's going to place a calling upon Moses because he wants to use Moses as an instrument. And that's the calling on Moses' life. So there's the lesson of availability there's the lesson of teachability. One final lesson would be this lesson, the lesson of dependability. Dependability. And so here's the question. Will I obey the calling of God on my life to do the will of God? Having made myself available, possessing a teachable spirit, teachable attitude, humble before God, am I now going to be obedient and the dependability I'm talking about is not so much God depending upon Moses as it is Moses depending upon God. <laughs> the one thing that we need to get straight is God doesn't need any of us. God doesn't need me. He doesn't need you. But God in his grace and infinite wisdom has chosen to use us to advance his mission in the world. And isn't that a wonderful thought that God would use someone like me? that he would use someone like you. So don't get that reversed in your life and think, okay, well, God is depending on me here. No, listen, God knows that you are but dust. He knows that you're frail. Your weaknesses and your frailties never take him by surprise, and yet he chooses to love you and use you despite all of that. <laughs> so God's call then upon Moses is specific. It's, it's tethered to God's nature and character and it involves God's mission of redemption. Moses, I want you to go. I want you to be the instrument that I'm going to use to bring my people up out of their Egyptian bondage. Moses would not be their savior. No, God's their savior. But he's going to use Moses nonetheless. I think one of the greatest definitions that I've ever come across for calling, calling, is this, this definition by Os Guinness. Listen to this. Calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism lived out as a response to his summons to service. <laughs> I'm going to read that one more time just so you catch it. Calling is the truth that God calls us to himself so decisively that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion and dynamism that's lived out as a response to his summons to serve. I don't want to go through life ho-hum, bored, forced to be like lawn chair Larry and find the next thing <laughs> just to entertain me because I'm so bored. No, how can I be bored when I've got such an enthralling God who's placed his call upon my life? Where every day is going to present a unique challenge and a unique opportunity for me to make much of Jesus in the world. Whatever it is God's called you to, whatever your vocation is, whatever your skill set is, whatever your talents are, whatever your passions are, use that. Let that be a catalyst. Commit that to God in faith and, and serve Him in that capacity and make much of the name of Jesus to your friends, to your family, and to the world around you. Well, I've got to stop there. Let's stand for prayer this morning. I'm telling you, our God is a God who sends his people. He places a calling upon our lives and he sends us into the world. How might he use you? How might he use you? You say, Pastor, I, 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 I just, I don't know. 
I, I don't feel like I can do much. Who am I? And you find yourself asking the very same question that Moses asks. And it's a good question because it means you recognize your own limitations and your own inability and your own inadequacy. But the answer to that question is not who you are. God says, I am that I am. And if I'm going to faithfully live out the calling that he's placed upon my life with enthusiasm, with joy, with passion and devotion, it only will come as the result of me knowing that he is my sufficiency and my hope is in Christ. And my confidence is not in myself, it's not in my abilities, it's in him alone. Lord, in Jesus' name, I'm so thankful for your word. And Lord, you've placed a calling upon our lives. The call to salvation, the call to be conformed to the character of Christ, and the call to serve you in your mission of making disciples and pointing the world around me to the hope that I have in Jesus. And God, that's true of us as a church. God, may 2023 be a year that we live on mission and recapture a sense of calling in what we do, Lord. Even when we get bogged down in the details and oftentimes we get discouraged in the work, Lord, would you rekindle a passion in our hearts and lives. You're the God of the burning bush. The God who called and sent Moses, you're the same God who's called and sent us into the world in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we love you, and we make this our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, amen and amen. Well, we're going to close in a song maybe this morning. Don, you have a song maybe we can close in? How about this? Uh, let me do it. All to Jesus I surrender. Is that what you're playing? All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. I surrender all. I surrender. you come brother you may have some closing announcements and you can dismiss us so I have no closing announcements is there one that someone can make us aware of okay so we have a yes sir I would say we will be open next Sunday and supercharged to meet the challenge of this message. Is that okay? I want to say to this church um, what the preacher preached today is what this church needs to go where you want this church to go. There is, there is a deep sense uh, among the people of this church to want to save this church. Right? It's, it's almost a desperation in your heart. Let me challenge you to give that desperation to God and turn the focus of the church that you love so much to the people in this community and when I say this community, I mean the one around this church and the greater community of Thomasville, North Carolina and Davidson County. If you, if we, I should say, pardon me, if we will do that, if we will turn our focus outward to the needs that are there, the people that are there, the call of God on our life to reach out and, and minister to those people, he will take this church to a great height. He will fill this church 
with those needy people that we can minister to. And he will, listen, he will also bring to this church the resources that we need, okay? He will not lead us, leave us helpless. He will bring us all the resources we need. All that he needs is what the pastor preached today, that willing heart, that passionate heart, that focused heart, that send me. I'm listening, send me. If we'll do that, God will bless this church in a great way in 2023. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time, for this message today. Uh, help us to hear the call of God on our lives and to, uh, to step up to that calling that everything we do, whether it, it be um, working for a company or leading a company or being in retirement or whatever it is, that everything that we do goes through that focus of uh, what is God wanting me to be? How can I be what God wants me to be? If we would do that, Lord, you will bless, you will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on all of us that we cannot receive. Thank you for this time. Take us away now safely and bring us back at the appointed hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week.